May the words of my mouth and thoughts of my heart be acceptable before you, O God, my Rock and my Redeemer. Shalom and welcome all to our Kosher Torah lessons. I'm, of course, your host, Ariel Bartzadok. You can find me online at koshertorah.com. I want to share with you tonight a very important lesson, which properly titled should be the value and the importance of what we can call the theoretical Kabbalah. Because theory without practice and practice without theory really doesn't get anybody going anywhere or understanding anything. For many, many years here at Kosher Torah, I have placed great emphasis on the practice of our meditative and spiritual Torah traditions. Uh, we have, I, uh, I, I think, probably the most in-depth, uh, advanced uh, course offerings possibly uh, on the entire web. But yet, in order to properly use this material, granted, you can learn techniques and ways to expand consciousness and have all types of experiences. But yet, what are those experiences? If you travel in your mind or in your spirit, where exactly are you going? What exactly are you experiencing? Well, if you cannot answer those questions, then it's like taking a road trip in the dark, being blind. You're going somewhere, but you can't see and you don't know, so you're missing out on the trip. This is where the value of what we call the theoretical Kabbalah comes in. You see, since biblical times, there has always been the practices and the experiences of the Merkabah traditions, the Ascent traditions, the, the, you know, the Aliyah, Sulam Aliyah traditions, all of these things. And yet, it wasn't until Zoharic times, possibly even later, into the, into the Torah of the Arisa, which is 1500, 1500s, that you actually had like the likes of a Rabbi Chaim Vital, and possibly before him the likes of a Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, who took all the ideas of all the realms of all the worlds and put it into some type of codified form so that you can actually look at it and understand it. Or in other words, a road map. This is important. You see, as we have learned here at Kosher Torah and elsewhere, as it is taught, there is what we call pshat, remez, drash, sod. Four general categories of Torah study. Simplistic meaning, emotional interpretations, intellectual interpretations, and psychic, intuitive, spiritual experiences. And to each of these levels, there is, of course, sub-levels within them. So some people will call Sod, or the secrets of the Torah, Kabbalah. That's not necessarily an accurate correlation. Because as is a point well made by many of the sages, you have what we call a Pshat of the Sod and a Sod of the Sod. In other words, many people today come and study Kabbalah as a metaphysical philosophy. And they get very involved in their philosophical discussions. And that's pretty much where the vast majority of Kabbalistic discussion is today. It's philosophical. And that's it. There is no experience with it. And therefore, it is void of any true depth and insight. Because all it is is theory without practice. Like I said, it doesn't really go anywhere. But yet... To have the experience and the practice without the theory underlying it, it's like going out in the blind. So it's important that both are in our hands. And we can go and make all different types of you know, correlations between Hochma and Bina, right column, left column, but whatever. It's not important for us to load up on the metaphors. What is important is for us to understand 
the nature of this very important and sacred relationship of what we call wisdom, intuitive psychic experience, and understanding, intellectual academic comprehension of what the heck is going on. As we've taught emphatically in the Sefer Yitzirah course, right from the beginning, you have to understand it wisdom and be wise with understanding. That's a foundation. The balance of the two. I called it oscillating consciousness. How to balance the things. Go to Sefer Yitzirah course, you'll understand in depth what I mean. But here's the practice of it. I want to share with you now a very peculiar section of the Talmud. That's right, good old-fashioned Talmud. This is the section of the Talmud called the Agadata, the legends or the stories or the teachings, compiled together in a book called the Ein Yaakov, and is beautifully and eloquently translated by Rabbi Finkel, and it is a single volume, expensive though it be, which is well worth your study. We have conducted many, many classes in the Ein Yaakov in a previous series, I believe almost 50 of them. So we have covered much material there, and we have a tremendous wealth of material for you to learn from this in koshitor.com. Well, this is one of those sections we did not cover in a previous class. So, I am now going to expose you to the original and authentic secrets of the Torah as found in the Talmud, if you will, the authentic Kabbalah of the Talmud. And the best way that I can do this is simply to read to you the section without necessarily stopping to pause or to comment, but to read to you and allow you to just absorb this material before we even comment on it. And then we're going to go into a Kabbalistic commentary to the Talmud, written by the famous Baghdadi author, Rabbi Yosef Chaim, famous for his uh, halachic law code, the Ben Ish Chai. He has a very profound and accurate understanding of this peculiar Talmudic passage, and explains it to us correctly, enabling us to understand and appreciate the depths and the wisdom and experience of the sages of the Talmud, something which is so sorely lacking today in our modern clergy. So with no further ado, I'm going to read to you from the English translation by Rabbi Finkel, as I've mentioned, uh, from Tractate Sukkah, page 5a, Hey Amud Aleph. For those of you who have the original in Yaakov, it's literally the first Agadata in Masechet Sukkot. And now I read. We have learned in a Baraita. Rabbi Yossi said, The Shekhinah never came down to this earth, and Moshe and Elijah never ascended to the highest levels of heaven. For it says, the heavens belong to God, but the earth he gave over to man. Psalm 115.16 The Gabara asks, But did not the Shekhinah come down to earth? Doesn't it say, in fact, quote, God came down on Mount Sinai? Exodus 19, verse 20. And the Gemara answers, That was above ten handbreadths. The Gemara asks, But it says, his feet will stand on that day on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14.4. Thus he will be below hand, ten handbreadths. The Gemara answers, this will be ten handbreadths above the ground. Asks the Gemara, but did not Moses and Elijah ascend to heaven? Does it say, in fact, quote, and Moses went up to God, Exodus 19, verse 3. The Gemara answers, that was to a level of ten handbreadths below the highest sphere of heaven. 
But doesn't it say, quote, It happened when God took Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind? 2 Kings 2 verse 11. The Gemara answers, That was on a level of ten handbreadths below the highest sphere of heaven. But it doesn't it say, Moses took hold of the throne of glory while God spread his cloud over him. Job 26 9. And Rabbi Tan Hom expounded, This teaches us that the Almighty spread some of his radiance of his Shekhinah and his cloud over him, Moses, proving that Moses did ascend to heaven. The Gemara answers, That was at a level of ten handbreadths below the highest sphere of heaven. The Gemara asks, Nevertheless, it says, Moses took hold of the throne of glory. Obviously, he did reach the loftiest level. The Gemara answers, The throne was lowered for Moses' sake until it came down to a level of ten handbreadths below the highest sphere of heaven. And then Moses took hold of it. And that's it. What do you make of that? What on earth are we talking about? Somebody here is jumping to the Ten Sephirot as a reference. Oh, really? Where in the Talmud do you read about the Ten Sephirot? Answer, you don't. The earliest known reference we have to the Ten Sephirot comes from, of all places, the Sefer Yitzhira. And depending on your scholarly debate when the Sefer Yitzhira was written, I am of the opinion that it's of earlier generations than later. Second, third, fourth century, in my opinion, the latest. And... When you are an honest scholar, you will recognize that the description and definition of Sefirot and Sefer Yetzirah is radically different from how the Sefirot are described and expressed in later philosophical Kabbalistic literature, the theoretical schools of the Sohar and everything emanating from the Soharic schools, which of course includes the Ari, all of Hasidism and the like. Sefi Yitzhira used the same term, referencing the same concept, but a very different understanding. So before you jump the gun and start to interpret the old in light of the new, what on earth are we talking about? If you really want to understand this section of the Talmud, what should you do? Answer, obviously. They should go to the classical commentaries. Being that this is a section of Talmud, you have the classical Talmudic commentators, Rashi and Tosafot and Rashba and the like, who write comments on these things. Go look at them. Go look, if you can, into an original Hebrew text of the Ein Yaakov, preferably one with the compendium of commentaries, and you're going to scratch your head in shocking amazement to realize that while this story is there, no one really comments on it. No one really offers any explanation of what it is that what we are talking about. So then, how should this be understood? This is why I shared with you right from the beginning. To understand this, helps us understand the theoretical Kabbalah, because this is the, we have to explain the theory. But it's not enough to explain theory. If the theory does not guide us and serve us as a road map for practice, which the sages of the Talmud certainly knew, reference to the famous section in Tractate Hagiga, which we covered in the Legends of the Talmud series, about the four who ascended to Pardes. Nowhere does it give instructions there about how they did it. But if you understand the Kabbalah of the Talmud and the true secrets encoded within the Talmud, ah, then you get it. So that's why, in my opinion, second to the Bible, the most deepest and profound Kabbalistic text of them all. It's not the Zohar, but it's the Babylonian Talmud. Edited by greats like Rabina and Rav Ashi, who, remember, 
we're sitting there with a tape recorder, sitting down recording conversations and just scribbling them down for posterity. No, they created a very highly and very scripted editorial function, which if you understand the Talmud, you recognize the ebb and flow between the rational and the super-rational, or what we can call halakha and agadata. And almost every other page of the Gemara goes through all of these different things. And if you could visualize a Talmudic page, you would visualize the flow of a moving and living river. And that is why the Talmud is called the Oral Torah, and why the Oral Torah is compared to living waters. So Talmud study is very important, but you also have to understand it in order to properly acquire its benefit. And understanding it isn't just to learn the halakha, but to understand the psychology of the nature of the flow of the page. And that few have ever inquired into, and certainly even fewer have understood. With this introduction and insight, let's now explain what this strange and bizarre Talmudic passage is all about. What is this talk about? Ten handbreadths under heaven, over the earth. What, what, what are you talking about? Ten sephirot. So Moses goes up to heaven under, under ten sephirot, and God comes down uh, to the earth, uh, but above ten sephirot. What the heck is that? What is a sephirot in the first place? This is something physical? It is a measurement? Should I take out my yard stick or my meter stick, depending on your country? Uh, well, how do we measure high, low, ascent, descent? How is this to be understood? Needless to say, we are not talking about physical measurements. Good gosh, even the famous Maimonides, Rambam, in his More Nebuchim, the Guide to the Perplexed, Volume 1, Chapter 10, for those who want to go look it up clearly explains to us that concepts and ideas such as ascent and descent are not referring to physical movement. But, to put it in a, mo a better or uh, modern ways of understanding it, elevations of, or if you will, descents of, levels of consciousness. When you want to talk about ascent and descent, consider it the expansion or contraction of consciousness. That is what it's all about. So forget about going from point A to point B in any physical context. And think about expanding your mind. And in that, let's turn now to Rabbi Yosef Chaim's commentary. It's called Ben Yehoyada. I'm reading from the second volume, page 137, for those who have the set. And I quote, Me'olam lo yirada shechina lamata me'esera. Never, ever, ever has it ever happened that the shechina descended lower than this ten. Even though Rabbi Finkel has in his version here the word hand breaths. Surprisingly, in the original, it doesn't say that. It just says below the ten. Now the Ben Ishai is going to teach us. And again, I quote, It appears to me with the help of heaven, Ben Ishai's traditional way of introducing something, to explain this matter, to explain this in accordance to what is written by our teacher, Rabbi Haim Vital, remember, the famous redactor of the Torah of the Arizal, and he's quoting here from the Sha'arei Kedusha, section 3, gate 6, of which we have covered at koshertorah.com, and those classes, again, are available in the Sha'arei Kedusha series. And he writes, Ki, Arba'a olamotem hanikra'in atzilut, beri'a, yitzira, and asiya. We know that there are four worlds. And they are called Asilut, Biria, Yetzira, and Asiya. Rather than translate them, learn the original Hebrew terms, because their 
translations don't help us in understanding what exactly they are or are not. These terms are references to what we call here four worlds. Now, we just learned that ascent and descent are never meant to be understood in any physical context. And therefore, when we talk about worlds, we must understand that we are also not referring to physical domains of any kind. And therefore, I don't care what kind of starship you will ever build, whether it's the uh, Starship Enterprise or a, uh, you know, an X-Wing fighter or whatever science fiction fantasy or reality starship you want to create, you are never going to go outside into outer space and go into one of these other worlds. You will never land on planet Atsilut, planet Beria, planet Itzira, or the like. Because the word worlds, Olamot, should better be understood as dimensional planes. Well, isn't a dimensional plane a location? Kind of like sliding from one dimension to the other. Good gosh, there have been television shows about that. Recently one like Fringe. Uh, previous to that, they had one called Sliders. You know, all these other kinds of parallel universes. Modern science speaks about the parallel universes. Isn't that what we're talking about? Yeah, kind of, maybe, but no. There are an infinite number of worlds in each of these levels. But these, what I refer to as dimensions, let's be very blunt. They are levels of consciousness. They are modes of thinking. So therefore, if you wish to travel into the Yetziratic universe, the only way to access the Yetziratic universe is through Yetziratic consciousness, which is radically different from Asiatic consciousness. You and I live in an Asiatic world, and therefore we are regularly and daily aware of what we can call Asiatic consciousness. Whereas Yetziratic consciousness exists in a parallel domain, which we every now and then go into. What are those? Those are the realms that we remember as dreams. Now, how many of us are experts in dream language? The answer is nobody is. How many of us can go into a dream, we see all the kind of weirdo things that we do and understand absolutely in every detail what it means, no one has to tell us, no angel has to come to explain to us, which means we're on a level higher than all the prophets. So as I said, it doesn't apply to us. You see, Yetziratic thinking makes complete and total sense at the Yetziratic level. And if there are Yetziratic entities that are trying to communicate to us in the Yetziratic language, which is communicated for them in clarity, but for us experienced in a dream, they get very frustrated that we don't understand our language. You want a good comparison? She might not like, but I'll explain it. As you all know, I have pets. I have my beautiful doggies. Well, to this very day, my dogs do not speak English or Spanish or Hebrew or Mandarin Chinese. In other words, if I were to go and ask my dog, hey, what should I pick you up from Walmart today? And the dog is not going to answer and says, well, you know those treats you got last week? No, 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 no. doesn't happen. And you know that. But yet, I can communicate with my dog. Can I communicate with him through certain words that his ears recognize and understand? Like, let's go out, right? Potty outside, or snack, or chicken. Oh, then the ears perk up, the, the head twists. Yeah, they understand that. Just like we understand certain cues in a dream. Do you understand what I'm saying? We are about as smart in the Yitzhiratic world as our dogs are 
in this world. <laughs> yeah, I'm comparing us to dogs. That's absolutely right. You got it. And we need to cultivate our sensitivities. You have dogs who become very smart. You can have primates who can actually communicate and, and through hand language, sign language, speak and communicate with people in involved construct. We should only be as intelligent in the Yitzhiratic language as these primate apes are in English. Granted, the ape is not able to articulate the words because it doesn't have the same larynx and, 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 and mouth forms as we do. But, you know, through hand sign, it can get it. It can understand and it can communicate. In the Yitzhiratic realm, we have to become sensitive to the Yitzhiratic language, which is the language of, if you will, emotion and picture, and become sensitive to receive and communicate back. And only when we have mastered Yetzirah-ese, if you will, Yetzirah-ish, yes, Spanish, English, Yetzirah-ish, how's that, make up a word. Only then can you then master the next language, which we could call Beriade, Beria, Beria-ish, and finally Atsilut-ish. These are languages which are not verbal, but constructs of consciousness. These are the four worlds. And in the last few minutes, in my descriptions of them, I've probably given you more insight and information than many, many people who study this material for literally years have been able to acquire. Now, you have these four worlds. Now he continues. Ulamatsa <laughs> mekulam Olam Nashefen, beneath the four worlds, you have the physical world, Nehalak La'arba Yesedot, which is subdivided into the four foundations, the Nehalakot Ka'ayin Esesfirot, and subdivided in the form of ten Sifirot. The four foundations is something we discussed in great detail in our Etz Chaim Gate 50 class. Uh, again, available on Kosher Torah. And notice he puts here this physical world below the four worlds, even below Asiya. You will find that in the Etz Chaim, that Rabbi Chaim is a little bit more specific and states that our physical world actually is one of the lower levels of the Asiatic plane. That all Asiatic dimensions are what we call physical universes. So then, in light of modern quantum physics, M-theory, string theory, and the like, where in which we have an infinite number of bubble universes, sliders, and the like, each one of which is physical. Physical, yeah, like this one. All of those are just the parallel dimensions in Asiatic, if you allow me to use the word, space. Okay? In other words, Asiatic communication will work at all those levels. But, even at the Asiatic level, you have levels within levels, and levels within levels within levels. So we could go to some other physical world in our universe or in another, whether we're taking the Starship Enterprise or Doctor Who's TARDIS, however we get there, we do. And when we arrive, we might find entities, physical entities, of a construct made up of what we call these four foundational elements. Again, we discussed this in detail in the Etz Chaim series, which are called by the classical Greek refer references as fire, air, water, earth, which we recognize as the four states of matter. Physical, liquid, gaseous, plasmic. You have physical entities. Physical, because they exist in Asiya, even though they're technically made of, if you will, plasma, but yet, that's still considered physical, that's still considered osseatic. You have entities which are gaseous in nature, a conscious entity of gas. That's not life as we know and understand it, but it is. And somebody in text is correctly making a reference. These entities that are of this structure 
exist in our world. And they are what we refer to as the Shadim, or the Jinn, or the Ruchot, even the Tali. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen the crop circles out there. Well, the real ones are actually made by what looks like ball light energy. Those are one of these energy entities. And yeah, they are physical. As you can see, they actually have physical constructs. So, orbs, that's right. So, yeah, those are all these things. And each of these entities, these, these foundational forms, interact in a, if you will, a general universal construct, which we refer to as the Ten Sephirot. In general, the Ten Sephirot, if you will, we can define as the generic or universal pattern of understanding reality. Pretty much as we think, as we think, in every reality, wherever we are, whatever dimension, whatever domain of consciousness. So, in that respect, the ten sefirots are, if you will, kind of like the spiritual, if I can use such a nebulous term, DNA, which is the underlying, if you will allow me to use the symbolic metaphor, cellular structure of existence. Now we continue. The Neve'er. Now let's explain. Kibakol Olam. In each and every one of these worlds, Atsilut Beria Yitzira Nasiya, these dimensional planes, Yesh Ur Pinimi, each one has what's called an internal light, an inner light. These are the lights of the ten Sephirot themselves. The Chutza Lahem, an external to them. You have Ur Mechatzev HaNeshamot, the light of the domain of souls. These, of course, are also subdivided into ten. The Chutzalo, an external to that, Ur Nechatzev HaMalachim, the light of the domain of the angels. Gamu Nech Gamken Nechalach Lesra, also subdivided into ten. The Chutzalo, and external to that, or chashuch, a dark light, shel nachatzev klipot, the domain of what we call the husk or the shells, the klipot, gamken nachalak lesra, and also ten of those, the chutzalo, and then the most external form, haolam atzmo, the world itself, which are shehem, they are harakiim, the heavens. Or, if you will, the outer space. Sheba Oto Olam, in each and every world. Gamken, the Hem Gamken, the Halak Lesser Bechinot. And each one of these are, again, ten aspects and elements. So, my goodness, what exactly did we just describe here? Let's see. The Sephirot, souls, angels, darkness, the world itself. Pretty much five different levels. And each of these is considered a dimensional plane in and of itself, which has ten variant degrees in each and every one of them. So we have five general, if you will, dimensional domains with ten levels of subtle nuance within each. Five times ten? Fifty levels we just described. Each one is a unique state of consciousness. So how many of us can differentiate 50 unique states of consciousness? Go ahead, write it down. Explain to me the difference between consciousness 1 and consciousness 2. Or consciousness 20. Or consciousness 22. 32. Yes, very difficult. This is the reality of the domains in which we live. And the reason why we study the theoretical Kabbalah. Because it's very similar to, as in martial arts, learning a form. I'll give you an example. While I am, after all these years, still not the best form learner, I still believe that learning forms in martial arts is very important. 
because it gives you some kind of structure through which to operate. It's the exact same way with this application of what we call the theoretical Kabbalah. It gives you a mental construct, a roadmap, as I said, that enables you to understand and to get insight into what you are experiencing as you are experiencing it. And needless to say, if you don't have any experiences, then you don't know anything anyway. So when you have a dream, and you go into Yitzhiratic ease, Yitzhira-ish, and all of a sudden there's a nuance within it, which might be more intellectual, might be more emotional, within the dream, which might be more physical, which might have one method, one representative or another. You might find that through understanding these different domains and what that and how they exist theoretically, through your experience, you have that thing, that proverbial light bulb that pops over your head and says, Oh, this is that. I get it now. Oh, I see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, now I understand. And that is how you learn the language. Continuing. This is the matter of the vision of Ezekiel the prophet upon him be peace that we call Maase Merkava. Oh, how wise is the Ben Ishai? He recognizes that Ezekiel's vision was no theoretical philosophical construct, it was a real experience. But as he had that experience, he knew and understand and then understood what it was he was experiencing. So I continue. Being at the levels are, if you will, blended with one another. Originally, the heavens were open. The gates of the heavens. What does that mean, that the gates were open? Does anybody know? When you p- penetrate the limits of the physical reality around us, the first domain is obviously with your eyes closed. And he continues, says, where do you go? Misham nichnas el klipot. You go into that realm of darkness that we just described. That realm of darkness is what we call in psychology, in Jungian analysis, the shadow realm. It's the realm of the unconscious, the subconscious, all that repressed nasty stuff, the Yetzir Hara domain, which is a realm and domain of our consciousness, our repressions within us. And when you go in there, you better be able to deal with that repressed content, or you will not be able psychologically to go into any greater depth into your own mind. And therefore, he quotes here Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 4, the Ar-e-hine, I looked and I saw the great storm, etc. You can go into my book, Call Upon My Name, you can go into Walking in the Fire, and look for my lessons which I wrote on the levels of the Klipont. These storm clouds, the the, uh, the, the storm that, that uh, excuse me, the, the mighty wind, the, the, the cloud, and, and then the claps of, of, of thunder or fire or lightning. These are psychological experiences of fear, of guilt, of unworthiness, which attack the mind when we try to penetrate and delve deeper into what we can call higher realms of consciousness. So therefore, if you are not at peace with your own self, you just can't penetrate any further. And that's why it is important that the character issues that we discuss so emphatically here at Kosher Torah have to be addressed right at the beginning of the meditative practice. Because in they, or I should say the lack of these character, you know, proper character traits will act as impediments, chasms, which make it impenetrable to pass into deeper levels of consciousness. That is an experience. 
Somebody's asking here about a ayahuasca. Does any of these hallucinogenic drugs give you an experience? These drugs can cause you to have psychotic experiences which can get your soul lost for countless reincarnations. They're very dangerous. Why? Because what they did is obviously chemically open up the brain and they push you into these other dimensions, these other domains. In other words, it's easy to kick open a door. But once you're there, what do you experience? Answer, whatever you brought with you. And if you have your yetzer hara, your evil inclination, or your unprepared mind, when you go into one of these trances, whether it be by ayahuasca, mushrooms, or whatever, peyote, well, boy, oh boy, you're going to have a real bad trip. And that's why we do not encourage the use of these types of things in our tradition, because we place focus on the long, hard, arduous path of doing it the hard way. So as to make sure you accomplish it right. And that is why it is important. Okay? So, all of those types of uh, mind-expanding, mind-altering uh, herbs and the like were always used in the most important, structured, and protected environment led by somebody, you know, like a medicine man, who knew who is what and what is how, and when people have bad, bad trips, know what to do about it. Because most people today, they'll take this in, in a proper supervised think, oh, I can handle it. And they end up causing themselves such psychological, psychiatric devastation that it's very, very bad. So, stay away. But now, moving right along. Ezekiel had to go through all of these, and he was able. Go read my essay, as I said, on that topic. And it was from here that he was able into entering into the domain of the angels. Here, because his mind was ca properly calibrated, he was able then to be perceive and become aware of the domain of the angels. Between each and every domain, there is this wide chasm. All right? And this then is the concealed secret with the regards to the matter of what we call the Hashmal. Alright? Whenever you go into a domain of consciousness, before you get to the other domain, there's this space, this period or place which is kind of like a tunnel, where in which things, if you will, go dark. I've known a lot of people go into the dark tunnel and they say, oh, I've reached the end, uh, the end so. And I said, no, 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 you're just in the tunnel. And I remember people saying, no, no, I'm at the end. And I say, well, go believe whatever you want. Go, go hang out in the tunnel. <laughs> it's not a feeling of being lost. It's a feeling of anticipating and waiting. And when you are properly trained, then you know how to maintain focus, you're given certain names to chant, certain visions to visualize, and that helps you to cultivate a more subtler level of consciousness, which we call going into another world. Alright? And he writes here again, that the word Hashmal, which we call the, the electric angel, if you will, we call that the garment. The garment is always that which cloaks that which is above it. You have to undress the garment before you can get inside. The Az Ra'a Eser Kitot Hamalachim. And only then was he able to have an experience of the ten domains or the ten powers, the ten groups, the different races of the angels. Asher Kulam Nahalakim La Arba Chayot, which are subdivided, if you will, to the four Chayot uh, angels and the four Machanot Shekhinah, and the four camps of the Shekhinah, you go into our discussion about angels and our other kosher Torah lessons to learn all about that. And again, he quotes here, this is what it says in Ezekiel, again, chapter 1, verse 5, And within it was the appearance of, the image of these four Chayot angels. And it's only here, that it was then able to enter into what we call the throne, 
And the throne is what we call the domain of the light of the souls. This is the secret of what it says in the Talmud, Talmud that the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that they themselves were the Merkava. We discussed that again in our Legends of the Talmud series. Go there. Umisham. And then beyond that, Hegia el Ur Sfirot Atzman. Only then does the mind enable one to penetrate into the domain of consciousness of the Sfirot themselves, which is the inner light of all the worlds. And this light is called Adam Ha'elyon, the supernal man. The supernal man is accessed through that which we call our higher selves, our neshama soul. This is actually discussed in depth in Jungian psychoanalysis, which has a very profound understanding of the Merkava experience as an archetype of the entire psychological transformation and expansion of the mind. That's exactly what it is. So, even though we write about Magid experiences, and many people might believe that they're having an actual Magid experience, well, as we discussed in our Magid classes from the Hesed La Abraham, as well as in the Magid course, you have Magids and you have Magids, higher level, lower level. But before you get into the actual higher domain of your higher self, the kind of experience like Enoch had with Metatron, remember they merged and bonded, there was a pre-existing Metatron for Enoch to be absorbed into. There was a pre-existing Sandal phone for Elijah to absorb into their higher selves. In order for that to occur, in order for that level to be accomplished, you have to go through all these other psychological realms. Komo Shne'emar, and he quotes here again the next verse, first one, six actually, Fa'al demuta kisei kimar e adam. And upon the image of this throne was like the image of a man. And this again concludes the words of Rabbi Chaim from the Shaharei Kiddusha. And now we can understand the words of Rabbi Yossi here from the Tractate Sukkot. Me'olam lo yerda shechina Never, ever, ever did the Shekhinah descend. Shehi soda malchut shebe'ese svirot lamata. Excuse me. Shehi soda malchut shebe'ese svirot. The Shekhinah, the divine presence of God, is again one of our metaphorical references to the lowest sefirah called malchut. Now, malchut is a energy which is the life force energy that gives rise to all physical domains regardless of their level whether they are solid, liquid gaseous or plasmic state they all emanate from a specific energy we call that the divine presence within every atomic structure. That's what we call the indwelling presence of God called the Shekhinah. But where exactly is this Shekhinah? Can we touch it? Can we expose it? Can we uh, discover it and examine it in the laboratory? I don't think so. Why? Because this light which we call the Shekhinah energy doesn't go below 10. What 10? What are we talking about 10? That the light of this life force energy, which we call the divine indwelling presence, only exists and can be found in the domain lowest, or I should say directly beneath it, which is called the light of the domain of the souls. Shehu gamkin nechalach le'esara which itself is subdivided into ten. Shehu omed chutza me'ora esesvirot, which stands, if you will, on the outside of the ten sefirot. The ken nami, also, lo yirada shechina 
This energy of the Shekhinah domain did not descend other than into the realm of the Neshamot, right? Those are the ten. That is that. Now, we're also going to describe how the realm of the Neshamot, right? Also, it descends only into the realm of the Malachim, which is a bit outside of that. Shigamu Nechalak Le'esara, right? Shilakach Ketavarafsa, right? Now, this is a very important secret of what we call an overlap. Each and every world overlaps the other. And we talk about this in the Ultra Chaim series, about how you have the sphere of one world penetrating into the lower world, how we refer to, if you will, the lower portion of one partsuf becomes the mochin of the partsuf below it, etc. Let's put all these symbolic metaphors aside and understand what we're talking about. Bottom line, if you're on the level of Yitzhiratic consciousness, there is a domain where in which the Yitzhiratic, Beriatic, if you will, overlap and blend. Where in which the Beriatic influence is in the Yitzhiratic. And that's a in-between state before you go into the darkness and come out completely into the Beriatic state. And then if you go out of the Beriatic state, you eventually get into that quasi-mixture of Beriatic Yatsiludic, and then to the darkness, the Pirud, and then to the Yatsiludic. So each and every domain is like this. So when we talk about the life force energy called Shekhinah, the only place that it is accessed is in the power of the Neshamot, and the Neshamot is the domain of mind and thought. So there is that overlapping realm in mind and thought, in the domain of the Nishamot, where in which you would sense something, and it goes dark, and you have to push through the dark before that light would then come upon you. So when it says that the Shekhinah never descended to the earth, but stayed ten above it, it's referencing that the light of the Shekhinah as an energy field never actually broke through all dimensional planes to crack open and physically materialize itself in this dimensional plane. That would be devastatingly dangerous. Comparison. Think about if we could create a wormhole vortex where in which I can actually open up the surface of the sun right here on planet Earth. That would be comparison to exploding a nuclear bomb, right? That extensive, tremendous heat. Can you imagine opening up a door and boom, there's the sun. <laughs> Everything just gets wiped out. Too much energy. Too much power. It cannot be handled in the physical domain. So for those who think that the Shekhinah was an actual physical energy, which could ever actually and physically touch the physical face of matter. It can't. It is the energy within matter. Now, for those of you who have ever done studies in science, you know how cells and atoms contain with them tremendous amounts of energy. We get nuclear explosions by opening up the atom releasing electrons and letting some of that energy out, whether it's from the, the nucleus or whatever. Because it's all concentrated energy. Multiply that by a, a scale that I, I don't even know by what, what scale to multiply it by. That is the actual Shekhinah energy. It's alive. And it's conscious. It's sentient. And you and I will never ever be able to touch it physically, or travel to it in the Starship Enterprise or in the TARDIS. But we can, when we penetrate into the levels and layers of consciousness, touch it in the power of mind. Another comparison. We know that electromagnetic energy travels in waves. Real scrunched up waves in the 
in uh, ultraviolet band to real flowy out waves in the infrared. Okay? Visible light. And we know there are plenty of wavelengths beyond visible light. Can you imagine if we could train our physical eyes, I don't know if it's impossible, to be able to actually see infrared and ultraviolet? We can detect them with our machines, but biologically we're not designed to experience them physically. Can you imagine if we could, or if we did, what we would actually see with our own eyes? Is it possible that we go into other dimensional planes of consciousness in which other bodies which exist in those dimensional planes do grant us insight into vision in the infrared or ultraviolet bands? Because the domains of consciousness that correlate to them enable us access and insight. That is what we're talking so he says, this is all what we described about this domain here. This is the domain of the ten domains of the angels. And he says, the hashta, Yossi, Masha Ketuv, and there, from we understand from what Rabbi Yossi says here, the Yerada Shemal Har Sinai, that God descended upon Mount Sinai. Asher hu lamala me'esra tefachim, meaning that it stood ten, if you will, tefachim, like it says in the language of the Gemara. And the Kavanahu, what that means is, the Ura Shekhinah, that the actual light of the Shekhinah, which we said is the Malchut level of the ten Sefirot, that exists within the domain of the Sefirot, that is called the inner light. Lubaka v'avar kol otam amadarigot did not break forth and pass through all these different levels like we said. Shehem al-Mudim Chutzah that stood, if you will, outside of it. Right? Shehem al-Mechatzavim she-me'a-mena-otam arab that Rav Chaim described here, right? Ela, Yerad b'Merkava meaning the light of that Shekhinah only was able to penetrate and down to that domain called the Merkava. Meaning, Behiyot kol ha-madarigot she-mechatzav ha-niskari It was able to penetrate those ten levels as we've described, and that is this murkav, this overlapping, like we've been describing. Okay, I see here that we are run out of time pretty much, as I anticipated. But I believe I've given you a tremendous amount of, I hope, something to think about. With the grace of God, we'll do part two of this class in our next uh, lesson. And we'll finish up this with a repeat of different things and greater depths of insights into what this all means. So again, let me conclude by reiterating. You must take this stuff seriously. It's not enough that you just accept the academic, the theory. We endeavor to teach and put the theory into practice. Go throughout all my kosher Torah lessons. You will see, I always try to take the theory and explain it to you in an actual psychological application as to what it really means to experience. And when you do, then you look back on the academic text and go, oh, now I understand it. And if we can accomplish that, like Rabbi Chaim says, like the Gemara says, we will have understood the great and true secret of what is called the Maase Merkaba. And on that note, I conclude. Again, I'm your host, Ariel Bartzadok. Thanks for joining me here at koshitor.com. See you in our next class. God bless. Good night. Shalom. 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 Bless. Good night.